on location in the Holy Land. David Taverner from UCB travels with Bible teacher and church pastor Mike Beaumont to trace the life of Jesus then and now. Any visit to the Holy Land brings you to some remarkable places, Mike. This is quite something. We're, we're sort of sitting at the top of an enormous Roman amphitheatre with Roman columns either side of a Roman street just ahead of us. <laughs> I mean, where are we? <laughs> yeah, you, well, you would think you'd suddenly woken up this morning and ended up in somewhere like Athens or Corinth or Rome, wouldn't you? Because it looks like we're in an utterly Roman city here. We're actually in a place called... Beit Shan, or Beth Shan, as many of us know it, which by the time of Jesus had become a thoroughly sort of Greco-Roman culture and city right here in the middle of the Holy Land. I mean, it is an enormous Roman amphitheatre. I mean, just trying to picture the scene when this was full of... How many people would have been in here? Well, they estimate that 7,000 people would have got in here, which is huge, of course, for those days, uh, in the traditional semicircular shape with a great stage in front of us. We can see some of the remaining pillars that were part of the sort of stage area at the front. It was enormous, apparently. So here would have been the place where, yeah, things like plays and theatre took place, um, but also apparently gladiators would fight here as well so it, it was the local entertainment place and it is really very huge and reflects the size of this city and the roman columns ahead of us there down the main street and ruins beyond of what well we've got a traditional city here so we've got as you can see a very straight street running down from where we are sitting right at the top of the theater and the street runs down with columns, colonnades on either side, and on either side of those would have been shops and the agora, the marketplace, leading right down to... And then you'll see this enormous sort of flat-topped hill mm. in front of us. That's what's called a, a tell. It's a mound of different layers of civilization that have built up over years. And that's the ancient city of Bethshan. That's the one that was a fortress of the Canaanites in the Old Testament period when Joshua and the people entered the land. This was one of the cities they were unable to take. And I think when you look at that and how high up it is and how steep those yeah. ramps are, then you can understand why. And it wasn't until King David that that was taken. Uh, it, it's in a sense an ignominious place because it was on the walls of Bethshan that some listeners will remember the bodies of Saul and Jonathan were nailed after they were defeated at the Battle of Mount Gilboa against the Philistines. Where does this place fit into the story of the life of Jesus? Well, it looks like you think, what on earth are we doing here? You know, have we gone off at a tangent here? Well, no, we haven't. Now, I need to say up front, there's, there's no mention of this place, Beit Shan, or Scythopolis, as it was known by the Romans in New Testament times. But Beit Shan was the capital of what was known as the Decapolis. Oh. Now, that is a word that we find quite often in the Gospels. We find that Jesus went on to visit the cities of the Decapolis. Decapolis means ten cities. And nine of those cities existed as sort of quasi-independent, self-governing cities under Roman rule with an utterly sort of Greco-Roman culture and feel to them. And those nine were on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. But there was a tenth one, and we're sitting in it right now. And this tenth one, Beit Shan or Scythopolis, was the capital of all those ten cities. And we know that Jesus visited the cities of the Decapolis, which ones exactly, we can't be sure. Might it have been this one? Well, it could be quite likely because it's simply in southern Galilee. It's not that far away from the southern tip of the lake. So he may well have come here. And if he didn't come to this city of the Decapolis, we are here because it's representative of some of the cities of the Decapolis that he did go to, like Gerasa, where the Gerasene or Gadarene demoniac was freed of all those demons. So we're here because it's symbolic of 
a particular culture that existed within Israel in New Testament times, and because it's also uh, symbolic of a place that Jesus undoubtedly visited, if not here, then other places very much like here. And we're sort of, what, between the Sea of Galilee in the north and Jerusalem. So anyone yeah, we, coming to this part of the world, you, you, you'd probably come through here or near here. Yeah, we're probably about, you know, a third of the way down between the southern tip of, of Galilee and Jerusalem, roughly speaking. Why would Jesus have come to these ten cities? Hmm. An interesting question, because, you know, didn't Jesus come to bring the message to the Jews. After all, he was their Messiah, that promised Old Testament figure who was going to come and fulfill the promises made in the Old Testament to bring them to completion and to bring about God's kingdom. But while Jesus came for the Jews and as a Jew, he didn't come only for the Jews. And in fact, in the New Testament itself, we find several references to Jesus reaching out beyond the Jews to Gentiles. And cities like this would have been predominantly Gentile, a mixture. There would have been Jews here, perhaps what we might call almost secular Jews today. Um, So it would have been a mixture. But Jesus clearly did reach out to Gentiles at times. I mean, for example, I've just referred to the the Gerasene uh, demoniac. Gerasa actually is in modern-day Jordan today, Um, and that was one of the cities of the Decapolis. We know that he visited the region of Tyre and Sidon. Matthew chapter 15 tells us that. Do you remember there's that story of the woman there who begged him to free her daughter uh, from demon possession? Mm. And he said, well, you know, I've, I've come to the Jews first and foremost. And she says... Yeah, Lord, you know, but even dogs on the the table get the crumbs. And Jesus was amazed at her faith and heals her daughter. There's that story of healing the Roman centurion servant in Matthew 8, the story of the Samaritan woman in John 4. And, of course, the Great Commission in Matthew 28 is to go into all the world. And that's exactly what those first Christians did. Jesus told them before his ascension, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. In other words, in ever increasing circles out from Jerusalem where those crucial events of death and resurrection had taken place. So his ministry was first to the Jews but not only to the Jews. And visits to places like this were like a foretaste of what was to come and how the gospel would reach the Gentiles too. But what was represented here, you said entertainment, you know, theatre for sure, but much more cruel types of entertainment we know. That, of course, (laughs) runs completely against the kind of values that Jesus represented. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just here in this theatre that the values run different, David. As we go out down that long colonnaded street, some of the practices that would have happened there would have been contrary to to God's way. Uh, there would be bathhouses around the corner where probably people bathed naked. And nudity was something that was seen to be personal and private in Jewish ways of thinking. So, in fact, it's not just here in the theatre, but... But the whole of this city had values and aspirations that were very different from those that Jesus taught and lived by. And of course, this is the very sort of place that needs to hear the good news of Jesus and to be challenged by his very different values. So would this place have made Jesus wince? I don't think anywhere makes Jesus wince, but I know what you mean. I mean, he, he mixed with people, didn't he, that made others wince. The Pharisees, in particular, were wincing constantly when he mixed with tax collectors and what they deemed as sinners. And what that meant was people who didn't meticulously keep the law like they did. You know, you know, we could have called them the wincers rather than the Pharisees because that summed up their life, really. And yet what we find is, is Jesus never winced. Whoever came to him, 
whatever their background, whatever their situation, even demon-possessed people, none of these made Jesus wince. Now, that doesn't mean that he was happy with their values, but he was happy to be with them. He was happy to sit with them, happy to share with them. Think of the number of times in the Gospels we find him going to the homes of tax collectors, these hated collaborators who would certainly make the religious lot wince. Yet Jesus went, why? To affirm their values, to affirm how they live? No, not at all. First and foremost, to be a friend. You know, friendship is still the most powerful tool in evangelism today. Very hard to tell someone that God loves them if you're not showing that love yourself. And so Jesus mixed with, if you like, the wrong sort of people and went to the wrong sort of places, not to be tarnished by it, not to approve of it, not to say, yes, those values of society are okay, really, but to have the courage to go in among them and to model something different. And in befriending them while not befriending their lifestyle and their practices, to seek for opportunities to teach them about God's love and God's kingdom. That could sound a little bit like Jesus is a bit of a prude. Oh, he was far from a prude, wasn't he? I mean, you know, what prude would, would change all those large uh, water jars in Cana into wine? He, he's not a prude, but he said that he came to reflect his father. I can only do what I see the Father doing. You know, we look at Jesus, we're looking at God. And so he's by no means a prude, but he does know that his Father knows best. You know, when his Father made humanity at the beginning of time, those references that we get in the early chapters of Genesis, he made us both to be like him and to know him, to have relationship with him. And it's when Adam and Eve chose for themselves and sinned that things started going pear-shaped and it's very often that choosing for themselves that leads people to to adopt values and lifestyles that are, are very different from what God wants but you know all of us when we get a car you normally get a maker's manual with it and if you want to know how the car works best you follow the maker's manual if you don't well fine that's up to you but if you run your car for 50,000 miles without having an oil change you can expect the consequences. And really, I think life's a bit like that. Jesus comes absolutely not as a prude, but he comes to say, look, this is how the maker says life is lived best. So he's not afraid of coming and mixing with people. But again, he mixes with people, but he doesn't mix with people's lifestyle and choices and decisions but rather he mixes with them, he loves them, and he constantly seeks to show them that Father has a better way. So are you saying that, you know, as Jesus walked these streets and observed what was going on, that he wouldn't sort of tut-tut? I'm absolutely convinced he wouldn't tut-tut because he, he didn't do that. But he did model something different. You see, in a sense, it would have been very easy for him to tut-tut because at one level, you can think, what is this city doing here? Why is there a Greco-Roman city with a Greco-Roman way of life existing inside of the Holy Land? Well, there are historical reasons for it, and different cultures had dominated this part, Egypt first of all, and, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans. But nonetheless, it still stands as a sort of stark contrast. What, what is this doing here? But you know, Jesus didn't tut tut when he came. To these places. Think again of one example we do know of someone from the Decapolis, that Gadarene demoniac. It would have been very easy for him to tut tut and say, it serves you right, mate. You've got that legion of demons in you. No wonder what you've been giving your life to in this godless place of the Decapolis cities serves you jolly right. Off you go. You deserve to go to hell. That's one thing for sure. You deserve everything you get. Not once do we find a hint of that in Jesus. So he, he never tut tuts, but equally, nor does he accept and approve. And finding that balance for us today can, let's face it, be challenging because we don't want to tut tut people all the time. 
we do want to love them, but we also want to say that there is a better way of living. There is a different way of living. There's a way of living that has God's blessing on it, and the way you're living doesn't. Now, that is a challenge. I suppose it's what's sometimes being called uh, the difference between living in the world and living by the world or, or living of the world. There's a reference in the Bible to that, isn't there? Yeah, there is. It's, uh, it's in John 17. In fact, it might just be good to turn to it and read it now. John 17 is Jesus' high priestly prayer, it's often called. Um, it's the prayer he prays shortly before he's about to be taken away and tried and crucified, where he prays uh, both for himself, recognising that the time has come, and then he turns to pray for his disciples, particularly that, that God would protect them. And then he'll go on to pray for, for all believers in the future. But John 17 verse 13 onwards says, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've given them your word and the world has hated them for they're not of the world any more than I am of the world. In other words, if you're truly following Jesus, there will be times when the world, and by that he means the world system, the world's values, will hate you, will tell you to grow up, will tell you to drag yourself into the 21st century, will say to you, how on earth can you believe stupid stuff like that? But Jesus goes on to say, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, Hello, not that you help them to go off in holy huddles. And of course, at the time of Jesus, there were those who'd gone off into holy huddles, like the Essenes down by the Dead Sea. Let's build a little fortress for ourselves and keep ourselves pure so we can't get contaminated by that nasty world out there. That's not what Jesus wants. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, they're not of the world, even as I'm not of it, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you've sent me into the world, I've sent them into the world. So Jesus doesn't want the world in us, but he does want us in the world, where we can be salt and light and where we can impact and make a difference, not withdrawing to holy huddles, though withdrawing to get recharged and refreshed as we do when we meet together as Christians is wonderful, but for the purpose then of going back into the world, going back into places like this represents that has different values and, and just pursues different things and has different ambitions, and not to let that into us, but to resolve that we are going to get into it and make a difference in our street, in our family, in our workplace, in our classroom, in our office, wherever we might be. I suspect as a pastor yourself, church pastor, you've um, had conversations with people, Christians, who say that there are you know, no-go areas. You know, it might be to do with going to the cinema or dancing or other forms of entertainment, things like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and you know what? I've been a Christian a long time now, and that list changes. <laughs> Why? Because actually all it ends up being is a cultural list. So, yeah, I remember my grandparents. My grandparents on my father's side were Anglicans, and my grandfather was a lay preacher there. My grandparents on my mother's side were Salvation Army, uh, full uniform and trombone and tambourines and the lot. And their generation... Things like going to the cinema or enjoying yourself on Sunday, in fact, doing anything other than going to church three times on a Sunday, was definitely sinful. Now, I don't think many Christians would think these days going to the cinema per se is sinful, though I think going to see some movies, you know, is certainly not helpful. So lists change. Uh, it wasn't all that many years ago when certainly in Britain, Christians drinking alcohol would have been on a no-go list. People probably have a, a wider perspective on that now. Getting drunk, absolutely wrong. Bible's clear about that. But these lists, these lists of what you can and can't do as a Christian, honestly, they always turn out to be 
cultural. And so I don't think lists are very helpful. I think what we need to do instead is to remember Jesus' exhortation in that prayer that he wants us in the world, engaged with it, making a difference, but he doesn't want the world in us. So that might mean different things for different people. And we need to be careful not to judge one another by what we do or don't do. You see, there's a great example of that in the church at Corinth in New Testament times, where Paul has to deal in his first letter to the Corinthians with some issues that were going on there that were very cultural. And there's this issue of, can Christians eat meat that's been offered to idols? Now, in all my years as a pastor, I've never been asked that because <laughs> it's not very relevant for us. But it was at the time. And you see, pretty much all of the meat in New Testament times in a Greco-Roman culture, the meat would have come from the temple sacrifices, pagan temple sacrifices. So the animal would have been offered, it would have gone out through the back door to the butchers at the back and then been sold. And Christians were saying, well, well can we eat this meat? And some were saying, absolutely not, that's worldly. Um, it's been offered to a, an idol or a demon first. And others were saying, meat's meat. And there's no such thing as an idol anyway. And Paul has to try and tackle this and sort of find a middle path of saying, listen, please try and be aware of your brother's sensibilities, but equally, don't dump your foibles on other people. So we can't make lists because this is about heart. Now, I think there are some things that are no-goes. Why? Because the Bible says so. Don't commit adultery was in the Ten Commandments. It's repeated by Jesus. In fact, Jesus lifts it, doesn't he? And he says, don't even commit adultery in your heart. So things that are clear in the Bible, we as Christians need to be clear about. And if we start fudging those, if we start saying, yeah, but you know, cultures change quite a lot and is adultery now what it was then? Well, yes, it is. So where the Bible's clear, let us be clear in how we live. Where, where the Bible's not clear or doesn't have to say, do you know what? we're all going to have to go to the Father and say, Father, what's this mean for me? If we're wise, we'll talk with other Christians about it too, whom we love and trust, because it's very easy to deceive ourselves, isn't it? And to convince ourselves that this is okay. The number of times I've had young people come to me and say, well, I, I feel the Lord says it's okay to have sex with my girlfriend before we're married. Um, I just feel he's given me a peace in my heart about that. Well, I always say to them, the peace in your heart is the deceitfulness of your heart. Why? Because the Bible's really clear on those issues. So sitting here, you know, it does bring home to me, it's not always easy to be in the world, yet not of the world, but that's the challenge of Jesus. I do not want you retreating from this world. I do not want you going up a hill in a holy huddle and staying there. I want you out here engaged, even as Jesus was engaged. I want you in the world, engaged in it, but I do not want the world in you. So watch your hearts, guard for it, and ask the Father to direct your steps just like he did. But we've got to be practical. I mean, think of a parent as a Christian bringing up their child or children in this day and age, all the challenges of that, how on earth do they help their child live in the world and not be of it? Yeah, very hard, isn't it? Because I think, um, you know, for children and young people in particular, peer pressure is huge. But I think where it starts is by letting the reality of relationship with Jesus be seen and lived out in the home so that church is not just something for Sunday but that they're in the home together as a family. You're praying about things, you're talking about things. When there's a need in the family, you know, your kids know the first thing you do is take it to Jesus. You don't keep it secret from them. When you've got a challenge at the workplace, you're open and you talk about it with them. So from an early age, what you're training them in is, look, this is about relationship with Jesus. And if you can hear Jesus and stay close to Jesus, yeah, like Jesus said in that passage there, There'll be times when the world doesn't like you. Actually, there'll be times when the world hates you. And do you know what? I think we've got to settle that. Not everybody will like me. And not everybody will like me because I'm a Christian. So why don't we settle that as our baseline? 
No, we're not going to please everyone. I, I think all of us like to be liked. I do. I'd rather be liked than not liked. But we have to come to the point of deciding if we're going to be a faithful, authentic follower of Jesus, there will be times when we're not liked. Now, please, let's not help that by being stupid and doing daft things. If we're not liked for that, serves us right. But if we're not liked for being an authentic follower of Jesus, I think it's important that we train our children and young people and ourselves, listen, that's par for the course. It's what this following of Jesus will involve at times. And if Jesus did come here, it sounds like he might have ruffled a few feathers, but he would have still been true to himself. Absolutely. And, you know, we see that in the Gospels again and again, don't we? Whether it's in a Gentile context like this or a, a Jewish context, he was a great ruffler of feathers. And yet, do you know what? The people whose feathers he ruffled most were the religious folk. People he upset most were the Pharisees. Actually, the people he spoke about to hell the most were the religious people. If that shocks you, check out your Bible for yourself and you'll be able to see it's true. So he wasn't afraid of ruffling feathers. But, you know, he did it in this incredibly sort of winsome way. He, he, he was among them and he sought to love them. And, you know, one of the things I've learned over the years is, if you'll understand how I put this, if people know they're loved, you can get away with blue murder. <laughs> In other words, you know, they'll forgive an awful lot of things if you know that they love them. And I think there was something about Jesus that as he went through the world and as he engaged with people, they knew they were loved. So when he challenged them, when he asked them awkward questions, when he taught them about God's kingdom, when he sent people away forgiven and then said, go and sin no more, there was something about that love that he'd shown that made them see that those sort of challenges were really possible to respond to. So as we look down on this amazing Roman amphitheatre and the colonnaded street, which is in surprisingly good shape <laughs> for thousands of years on. It certainly is. Are you impressed that Jesus didn't skirt around places like this, but came to them? Oh, absolutely. You know, and as we've said, we're not sure whether he came to this particular city. I think it's likely, but he certainly came to some cities of the Decapolis. And he didn't avoid them. He didn't avoid going into Syrophoenicia. He didn't avoid contact with that Roman centurion. There was no one Jesus avoided. Why? Because he believed that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And that's the encouragement that I think we can take as we respond to the challenge of Jesus to be in the world, yet not of the world. Because there is someone in us who is greater. Well, for all of us, as we try and work out how to put that into practice, perhaps you could pray for us. Lord Jesus, help us to learn what it means to be in this world, yet not of this world. To engage with it, yet to be separate from it, especially in those areas where you speak to us so clearly in your word. We're amazed at how you did engage with this world and we want to engage with it too because we want to be fruitful for you. So Jesus, in this place, that is such a different culture. Help us to learn from you, to model our own lives after you, and to follow where you went and to walk as you walked, that we might impact our godless culture today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mike Beaumont and David Taverner in the Holy Land, tracing the life of Jesus then and now. Check out the UCB website for the free episode guide with photos, Bible references and background information. Go to ucb.co.uk forward slash Jesus then and now. 
And you can hear more 30 minute conversations with Mike and David talking about the Bible on the UCB Player app. Under podcasts, just select Bible books, Bible biogs, or Bible surprises. Bible surprises.